Well, welcome everybody to uh, St Mary's University uh, for our first talk of our Physics Cafe series. So first of all, I'd like to congratulate you all because you are all pioneers. Uh, you're the first people to attend the very first and very, very exciting series which we'll be developing over the coming months and hopefully over the coming years. My name is Claire Taylor, I'm Pro Vice Chancellor here at St Mary's. I'm delighted to welcome you, particularly members of our local community, uh, families who come in a little bit far, and further afar as well. And uh, we hope that you'll get a little bit of a taste of what we do here at St Mary's, but particularly that your uh, interest in uh, physics and particularly the area of nanotechnology, our best friend or worst enemy, tantalising title there, that will just kind of get your interest a little bit to find out a little bit more. So uh, without further ado, I'm going to introduce uh, Dr. Elisabetta Canetta, who's one of our uh, physics lecturers here at um, St Mary's. Uh, future um, Physics Cafe series um, sessions will be delivered not only by Elisabetta and colleagues from here, but also from colleagues at the National Physical Laboratory with whom we work uh, with our applied physics degree. So plenty of variety to come up, and uh, I hope that you look out for uh, the rest of the talks in the series. So, over to you, Thank you. Thank you, Claire. Well, welcome everybody to this, uh, as Claire said, the first uh, um, talk. So um, I chose uh, the topic of nanotechnology, first of all because it's one of my expertise as, as a physicist, but also because I believe uh, is a topic that interests us um, as human beings, because we are living nowadays in what is called the nanotechnology era. And uh, I think it's good to understand why we live in a nanotechnology era and uh, what are the pros and cons of living in such an era. So um, now, the first question that uh, we should ask ourselves is, what is nanotechnology after all? We keep hearing this, uh, this word, but do you really know what it means? Well, nanotechnology, um, if you, you know, just look up nanotechnology in the dictionary, what it will tell you is that uh, it is uh, the um, engineering of functional system at the molecular scale. That doesn't mean much, does it? Not really. So let us try to understand what it, it really is. First of all, um, we have to understand what the nanoscale is. We keep hearing about microscopes, about uh, um, you know, going uh, uh, to space, so very macro scale um, level, but what is the nanoscale? What does it mean? To make the point of what nanoscale is, uh, I prepared here, I have two of them, so I will split them <laughs> and you can pass them around. There are three specimens here. One of them is a very macro scale one, is a coin. 1p coin, okay? Then we go a bit further down, it is a human air, okay? Just one. And this is about 50, 60 microns. One micron is 10 to the minus 6 meters, so it is uh, uh, like, uh, you know, 1 million, um, 1 over 1 million meters. And here I've prepared two specimens of uh, micro bits. One of them is a 30 microns, uh, micrometers bead, the top one, and the bottom one is one micrometers bead. Now you will try to see if you can see them. There are plenty of them because uh, the sample I prepared was extremely concentrated, so there are probably millions of them. But I really, you know, want to see if someone, some of you can tell me, yes, I saw one of them because you, you literally can't. But they're there, and that is the nanoscale. So uh, you can pass them around and have a look just to start having a feeling. Okay, well, one is here and one I will pass them here. Okay, you can just pass them around to try to see the difference. So I prepared these two specimens to make you feel what it means to work at the nanoscale. You work in the invisible basically, which is what personally fascinated me. I wanted to understand what I couldn't see after all. So now the reason why people are so obsessed 
with the nanoscale. Why people want to have something which is smaller and smaller and smaller. If you think about your mobile phones, uh, your mobile phones become thinner and thinner and thinner. Now they are so thin that they are almost a sheet. But everything is still in there. There are still transistors, there are still batteries, but everything must be uh, you know, miniaturized, so everything must become extremely small. So that's why there is this obsession with nanoscale. But there is another reason, not just because it's handier to carry a mobile phone which is not uh, you know, a massive piece of metal. There is another reason, and the reason is uh, the properties, the physical properties of uh, um, nanomaterials. Nanomaterials are, I will talk a, a bit more about nanomaterials, but they are very much uh, with us and I will show you where. Uh, but the other thing is that the physical, mechanical, chemical properties of materials at the nanoscale change drastically. So this doesn't mean that they become better, but certainly they change. And sometimes they change in a way that they can make the sort of job uh, better than the, the same material but at the macro scale. Okay? So the properties will be enhanced. For example, a material which can conduce electricity will conduce electricity much better at the nanoscale, which is, for example, the reason why you have transistors which are smaller, smaller, and smaller, and smaller. Now, in order again to show the differences between the properties of a material at the nanoscale and the same material at the macro scale, I prepare a bit more than two, prepare ten of them, so you can play around, of these things. Now, you can wonder what on earth is this thing. This one is called non-Newtonian fluid, and I've got plenty of them. Now, a Newtonian fluid is usually fluid that uh, uh, follows the third, third law of Newton, uh, Newton's third law, which means that if you, you know, apply, so you act basically on the material, the material will respond, respond straight away to you in a quite predictable way. Like, for example, if I kick this one, this one will move. Simp as simple as that. This liquid, uh, this material, doesn't work that way. Now, if you see, and you will feel it, it's quite liquid, yeah? But if I compress it very strongly and suddenly, it becomes solid. Okay? You, you can feel it. You can do that and then compress it, and you will feel that it becomes solid. So again, I will pass it around. You can play around as much as you want. I have plenty of them. You can have one, whatever. Then, sorry. You can really whoop, squeeze it. Oh, thank you, Peter. You can squeeze it, uh, try to. So sometimes it's a bit, it's a bit uh, there is water inside. So <laughs> you have to excuse if it is a bit, you know, sort of watery. Then I have some more here. Oh, thank you, Anne. Thank you so much. So, now, as you can see, if you leave it alone, basically, is liquid. But if you start compressing it or even squeezing it slightly, but suddenly it becomes solid. Yeah? Can you feel that? Now it sounds strange and you can wonder what on earth is in there. Now in there, there is only core starch and water. It's made of core starch and water. Nothing more than that. And that is a non-Newtonian fluid. So what is happening? It's happen what is happening is that uh, when core starch and water come together, they start and you compress them, so you basically apply a pressure suddenly, the interaction between the two of them changes completely. So they don't behave anymore as at the macro scale, they interact in a different way. Okay? And that concept is used um, already in, for example, some armors that they are used to protect the body. So there are some foams which are very soft and comfortable if you leave them alone. But if someone is punching you and, is pun and you are protected by this foam and is punching you and the foam, obviously, suddenly 
then the foam will become solid and so your body will be protected. This is used, for example, in army forces, etc. So these are nanomaterials. And corn starch in water is a nanomaterial, after all, in its own right. Okay? So this is just to give you a feeling of what it means to work at the nanoscale and what type of changes you can, you can have. Other materials which are non-Newtonian are, for example, ketchup. When you use ketchup, you're using a non-Newtonian fluid. And in fact, sometimes you try to squeeze the ketchup, it doesn't come out, and then it comes out all of a sudden for that reason. Okay? Or toothpaste, another non-Newtonian fluid. So as you can see, there are plenty of them. Now, again, talking about nanomaterials, uh, nanomaterials, uh, some of them exist in nature, but some others don't. So most of the nanomaterials we use nowadays are engineered, so they are made by, well, by us, by scientists. There are two ways to make a nanomaterial. The two ways, the two methods are top-down or bottom-up. The top-down, it means that you have a material, a buck, very coarse material, and you start basically cutting down the material, like etching the material chemically, or basically um, creating small, small um, particles out of it. And this is the way, for example, microchips are created, are made. Microchips are the little things that they are in your mobile phones, in your PCs, and they make uh, all your little gadgets work. So that's the way they are made. They are made from a very huge bug and then chemically etched in order to get the microchip. The bottom up is basically the other way around. You have atoms, individual atoms, and you put them together somehow in order to create a material. This is what uh, the, the method used to make uh, nanoparticles, and we will talk about nanoparticles. So what the scientists do, they move around atom by atom, they put them together, and they create uh, a nanoparticle that can be some of the, nano, the microparticles that they are in the samples are one micron, which is, they are huge, they are really huge. Nanoparticles are from 100 nanometers below. One nanometer is one billionth of a meter, so you can't certainly see them. So now, if we think about history, um, the development of human beings uh, is very much related to um, how they use materials. If you think about prehistory, for example, if you think about the Stone, um, stone Age, then people in, during the Stone Age era, they were using stone to make everything, even you know, beds, furniture, etc. There are some very ancient villages, and uh, not only the Stone Age, Stonehenge sorry, area, where still there are beds, furniture, uh, which are made of stone. That's what they were using. Because this is the only thing they had or they could manage, they could handle. After that, we have the Bronze Age, where they started using bronze and their alloys, and then Iron Age. And uh, for about 2.5, well, in the last 2.5 million um, years, we went from Stone, stone Age up to about, uh, well, beginning of probably 19th, uh, 20th century, particularly the 19th century, when we had, uh, we had uh, what is called the first industrial revolution here in Britain, in the UK, in the middle of 18th century. This was a huge uh, breakthrough when uh, all the steam engines were discovered, where uh, basically industry literally started. People were, for example, waving wool or fabrics, uh, but after the industrial revolution, uh, industry started in order to wave um, or to make fabrics, uh, materials, etc. After that, in the middle of the 19th century, we had the second industrial revolution, which was uh, UK, Germany, and uh, America, the US, and was called the technological uh, revolution, where uh, people started uh, um, building rail walls, um, rail uh, basically ways, um, again more industrialization, more um, technology, uh, automobile, automobile sorry, so cars, etc. After that, so about in the 
28th century. So as you can see, every 100 years, starting from middle of 18th century, we starting having more and more revolutions. The last one, which is the revolution we are experiencing, the third revolution, the nanotechnology one, started about in the probably 1980s. So about 30 years ago, 20, 25, no, 30 years ago, I would say. It was the period when the first mobile phones appeared, which were, they were quite massive, I would say. I remember my first one was quite, quite, quite a back, quite, quite a huge one, but it was working. But it didn't really do what our mobile phones do now, and just about, what, 30 years have passed. So in the last one, the nanotechnology era, which is the era in which we are living now, um, people are more and more obsessed with um, moving atoms and uh, working with individual atoms, basically, to make materials, to make what we use nowadays. So, for example, if you think about, uh, uh, many, of you, many of you probably have used uh, um, anti-scratch uh, paint for your car or for your, the external walls of your house. Now, those paints uh, is a blend of uh, a polymer and uh, silver nanoparticles. Because there are silver nanoparticles inside, the material becomes very abrasion resistant. So you can scratch it even and it doesn't uh, suffer any damage, which is good for cars and uh, the walls of your house, etc. Um, another uh, application of nanomaterials is in lithium, lithium ion batteries which are used in some of our pieces, the pieces who have batteries who can last for seven hours or eight hours are lithium batteries and the reason why they can last for so long is because there is a blend of carbon nanotubes inside to make them last for so long. Um, another example are carbon nanotubes which are used in transistors, the transistor that we have in our mobile phones and they can do so many things and uh, um, they are so, so tiny. So now nanotechnology, now you can think nanotechnology is something that exists only now, some started now. Well it isn't, nanotechnology started uh, well long, long time ago. If you think about all the glass technologists, the medieval glass technologists, they were nanotechnologists. Because most of, not most, all the wonderful um, color glasses that we have in the churches, etc., they are made of glass, of course, but the glass is impinged with specks of copper or gold, etc., to get the different colors. Like um, there are glasses that can be both red or green according to the light. Uh, in some churches, in particular the Gothic churches, these type of glasses are there. And because they are impinged with uh, um, specks of copper, and according to the sort of oxidization of the copper, you can have red or green, which is uh, something which is triggered by the light. But another example, which is in the, at the British Museum, if you haven't seen it, please go, it's, it's amazing, is what is called the Lycurgus cup. The Lycurgus cup is a cup uh, which was made in the fourth century um, of, well, of the, the year, um, the un, well, in, in Italian we call it Annus Domini, which means after basically Christ was, was died. So that year in the fourth century, and it was made here in Britain. And his um, characteristic is that it's made of a glass, which is called dichroic glass, and uh, the British Museum is inside a box, basically, and you can light the light, switch on the light at a certain angle. When the light is off, you will see the cup as green. If you switch on the light, you will see it as red, and it is a beautiful red. Okay? And that was made by people who didn't really know about nanotechnology, but they were nanotechnologists. So nanotechnology is with us since a very, very um, long time. Another application is on our clothes, for example. There are some clothes nowadays that are water repellent or they are stain repellent or they are supposed to. Um, so basically if you stain yourself, nothing is left, which is very good. You don't have to, you know, basically try to clean it or um, try to get rid of that stain. And this is because on the surface, you can't feel it, but it's there, there are a lot of little, little hairs which are um, 
sort of rolls, little rolls of a few nanometers, which is a nanomaterial. So it's like a sort of fur, basically, but at the nanoscale. That's why they are waterproof or they are stain proof. Um, so then another example, something that you use during summer, sunscreens. If you, if you, when you buy sunscreen, if you look at the ingredients, you will see all of them, or most of them, they have nanoparticles inside. They have either zinc oxide nanoparticles or titanium oxide nanoparticles. Now, the reason why there are these nanoparticles inside, because when you spread the sunscreen on your body, you basically, you are creating a shield, literally, of nanoparticles on your body, which will protect you very well from UV, etc., etc. Now, the previous, the older version of this sunscreen had quite large nanoparticles. Large means 300, 400 nanometers. So when you were spreading them on your body, it was like white. So some sunscreens were leaving a sort of white layer on you. These were the nanoparticles. Now they're tiny, tiny. So they basically they become transparent to light. But they're still there, and they're making quite a good protection for us. So as you can see, you use nanotechnology without probably knowing it. You are you're already using it. You are really putting it on your body. Many cosmetics, particularly the L'Oreal ones, they are nanoparticles based, for example. Now, these are sort of advantages of uh, uh, nanotechnology. But obviously, there are also sort of downsides of nanotechnology. So now, let us see which are the downsides. Nanotechnology is good and it is bad. We have just to um, use it carefully. It is bad because we have to be careful to our health. Nanoparticles are extremely tiny. Obviously, they're just a few nanometers. So their properties are changing, so they change. So what do we know? Well, if a material is uh, um, behaving in a certain way at the macro scale, this does not mean that it's behaving the same way at the nano scale. So we have to be careful and be sure that we know how it's behaving. Otherwise, we are going to make a mess of ourselves and our environment. So health issues are the main issues in nanotechnology. And there is a lot of debate going on in the government, among scientists, etc., etc. So one of the advantages in health of uh, um, nanotechnology is what is called nanomedicine. Nanomedicine is still in its infancy, after all. It, it's not really there. But we start experiencing it slowly, slowly, slowly. In particular, in cancer research, there is a lot of um, talking about gold nanoparticles, which are already used in cancer um, treatment and cancer therapy, where the patient is injected with uh, um, gold nanoparticles of about probably 20 nanometers, even smaller than that. They are coated with a certain uh, um, protein, certain chemical, which is attracted by the cancer itself. So when then this nanoparticle finds a cancer cell, um, it will basically, well, it depends on what the, the nanoparticle does. Some of them, they are uptake uh, by the cancer. And once they are inside, they basically release the drug which, is, which will kill the cancer. Some others, um, they will just release the, can the, the drug being outside the cancer cell. But these are already technologies which are there. And some people are saved by um, nanomedicine, in particular people who are affected by cancer. But again, here there is a downside, the nanotoxicology, which is already, again, something which people talk about, not just scientists, um, also policy makers, uh, philosophers, a lot, social, social scientists, again, a lot. Um, so nanotechnology is a, basically a um, topic which is not just for scientists, it's also for people who work more on the philosophical, ethical side of it. Um, now, the reason why, again, there is so much debating, because, as I said, it can be good, but it can also be bad. And not just for us, also for the environment. There are already um, a lot of nanotechnology sort of methods used, for example, to purify water, which is good for places where the water is not 
um, you know, is, there is not so much water and most of it is uh, um, contaminated. So there are techniques now, nanotechnology uh, membranes, in particular made of nanofibers, which um, can uh, purify the water uh, without leaving any residue. So then people can drink that water, which is a good thing. But then there is the downside. The downside is uh, the membranes of which, well, the material, the nanomaterial of which these membranes are made can be biocompatible, so is basically, can nature deal with this material or will be contaminated by the material? Because some of these materials are made of heavy metals. Now, if a heavy, if a, a heavy metal goes into, the, for example, a water stream, then can kill fishes, which is recognized, and or if a fish um, basically is, well, lives in that water and we eat that fish, then the heavy, the heavy metals will go in our body and will be poisoned. So there are a lot of downsides and we have to be extremely careful to what we use and how. And that's why there is so, so much debate and so many solid sort of policies uh, um, in place. This is called nanopollution. So we, just, just the pollution we have uh, in our cities, but this is something more dangerous because it is invisible. So we can't see it, but it's there. So um, another effect of, uh, uh, another impact basically of nanopollution is in plants. There are now um, new studies uh, of uh, um, basically a type of soil that can be used in order to have plants growing very quickly. This soil is treated with uh, titanium dioxide particles. Now, these titanium dioxide particles, uh, people don't really understand if they are dangerous or not, but the study are um, about the uptake of, of these nanoparticles from the plant. Because if the plant is uptaking the nanoparticle and the plant is, for example, eaten by either an animal or a human being directly, then the nanoparticles will go inside the human being. And if they are toxic, the human being will be poisoned. So there is a lot of debate about what to use, how, and how harmful can be. But maybe it's not going to be harmful now, but it can be harmful in a longer term, which is something people need to think about. Another area in which nanotechnology is helping us hugely is energy. Um, not just energy storage, uh, but also energy saving, because there are the new type of thermal um, insulators, materials, uh, which are extremely good to do the job of insulate thermically our houses, and they are nanofibers based on nanocarbon nanotubes based. And another area where nanotechnology is doing a good job is the area of enhancement of renewable energy sources, which is good because some of the energy sources we are using, we run out very, very quickly, or not very quickly, but quite, quite soon, I would say. So we have to find other sources. And some of the sources that have been found, which are nanotechnology based, are very good. But then there is a downside, which is... Um, a sociological downside. Um, if, for example, we create a wonderful renewable source, which is nanotechnology based, that means that all the countries who, for example, use oil or export oil as a source, then will uh, experience an economical crash. So the downside is on society. It's good on one side, it's bad on the other. It's probably good for one country and bad for the other country. So we must keep a balance somehow, which is what is difficult with nanotechnology. So as you can see, it's a, it's a very complex and articulated subject, and it's not just scientific. Um, and it's got a huge impact on us because we use it, but also on our society, on our economy, on, uh, on our market, and so on. Now, I want just to basically try to wrap up uh, what I'm talking about this way, then we can start uh, our discussion um, about now technology, if you have a question or what I've talked about, if you want to know more about some things that I've mentioned. But there are a couple of discoveries uh, which are very recent uh, um, and people talk uh, quite a lot about it. Uh, one is the manipulation of light. Um, light is a beautiful thing but can be manipulated. 
manipulated and there are new lenses which are nanotechnology, well, nanomaterials are made of nanomaterials, um, which in future will allow us to see extremely small um, objects, which is good, for example, for biology um, or medicine, etc., without using uh, enormous uh, uh, microscopes as we are doing at the moment. But the other one, the other manipulation is even more intriguing, it's, co it's called the cloaking device, um, and cloaking means invisibility. So objects can make invisible by manipulating the light, which is again something quite, uh, quite amazing. There are future directions in nanotechnology. So one direction is what is called molecular manufacturing, which is also called the Star Trek replicator. Now, I don't know how many of you are familiar with Star Trek, but there was in Star Trek a replicator, which is a machine that can make things. If you want a cup of tea, you can just ask the replicator for a cup of tea, and a cup of tea will appear. Now, this is possible, and people are studying how to make it a reality. It's possible because if you manipulate atoms, like the atom of the cup and the atom of your tea, and you assemble the atoms in the right place, you will have your cup and you will have your tea inside. So it is possible, and they're working on it in order to make a replicator a reality. Um, then the other um, area in which nanotechnology is advancing at a very fast pace is uh, medicine, which uh, was called nanorobots. Um, some nanorobots are being developed in order to make uh, surgery, uh, but inside the body. So the idea is to have the nanorobots injected in the bloodstream of the patient with all the tools needed for the surgery, and it will be the nanorobots guided, obviously, by the surgeon outside the body <laughs> of, the, of the patient to perform the surgery. This is still in its infancy, but there is quite a lot of research going on in there. And then, obviously, the environment in order to make our environment cleaner and cleaner and cleaner if possible. So just to basically conclude, as you can see, nanotechnology is our friend and can make our life easy, comfortable, enjoyable, but we have to be careful how we use it. We have to understand what we are using, not just to use it because it makes our life easier, but to understand if we can use it, basically. So because we are living in a nanotechnology era, we must understand what nanotechnology is about. But not just the scientists, even all of us who are using that, uh, those gadgets and those materials. So basically, uh, I like to use an old saying, which is, says knowledge is power, which is true. It's true for nanotechnology. We must know what we are using in order to make the best use of it without getting basically hurt or harmed by what we are using. <coughs> so I leave you with this one. So thank you so, so much for listening. And uh, please uh, you know, ask as many questions as you want. Uh, and uh, we more, I will be more than happy to have discussion with you about this topic. But thank you so much for your patience and for listening. So is there any sort of burning question or something you want to know more about, something I haven't talked about? No, there wasn't, sorry. Is there any question <laughs> about what I said? Yes, Peter. I know you said that now knows now knows. Yeah. But effectively, the Star Trek idea, that they are sending a 3D printer up to the space station, aren't they? Yes. But the 3D printer is not nano, is it? Well. To be honest, um, on one side it is, because now the 3D printing, the way it works, you have basically a polymer, which is, uh, um, well, you deposit the polymer layer by layer until you get whatever you want in 3D. And some polymers, uh, if, um, they are basically blended with uh, um, nanomaterials. So in its own way, it's prob well, it, the technique itself is not nano, but the materials used to um, create what you, you want, to print what you want, is nanotechnology. So it is a blending of sort of macro scale and nano scale. Th that's why nanos, nanotechnology is a bit anywhere, because it fits in whatever we do, after all. So, 
um, yes, and uh, you know, they are trying, well, they are sending 3D printing from space or to space, uh, and th there is a lot of, of uh, nanotechnology going on in the uh, International Space Station for, for this reason, to understand uh, you know, how things uh, work, uh, uh, not only here, but also uh, sort of absence of gravity, etc., to see how the material behaves in different conditions. So this was a good point, Peter. Anyone else? Yes, John. I'll probably break and ask you something. Could you say about some of the things that can be um, potentially damaging? Yes. Be metals, but they're yes. damaging all kinds of levels. So are there some new hazards because of the nanoscale itself? So yes, the Yes, I mean, the, the heavy metals are one problem, but it's a problem that is, all, well, is, is there since quite a while. There are new um, problems uh, linked to the fact, the fact that the material is at the nanoscale, because uh, the problems are linked to the fact um, that many times we do not really understand why um, a material is changing its behavior at the nanoscale. We know that it's doing it, that's fine. But many times we do not understand why. So we can't really control it. And we can't really control the effects because we don't know what's going on. We know that it's happening, but we don't understand why. That's why knowledge is power. Because if we keep using something just because it works, but we don't understand why it works in that way, it can be a dangerous thing. We can't just use something basically blindly. So the damages are more because we don't understand why it is working in that way. Why, for example, the magnetic properties of some materials are better at the nanoscale? What does this mean? Is going to be a good thing or a bad thing. We can't control it. We just know that it's happening. That's it. And this is dangerous. I mean, it's the downside of nanotechnology, basically. Is there anyone else? Yes, Anna. There are no silly questions. My daughter's the biggest Harry Potter fan there is in the world. Yep. How long will it be before Christmas I can buy her an invisibility cloak? Not long, because, not long at all. Because there is someone in the US who has discovered the way to make an invisibility cloak. <laughs> it's basically, you have to put your daughter behind the lens, okay? And then this particular lens will somehow deviate the light. So the light will go you know, around your daughter and your daughter, you will see probably the head but not the rest. Yes, so it's possible, it's possible. And there are some materials now, they're called metamaterials, because they're, they're, they're called metamaterials because the properties are between nanoscale and macroscale, it's like in between. Um, people don't, still don't really understand how they work, that is the, the downside, but um, they can deflect the light. So whatever is uh, underneath this uh, uh, object with this metamaterial, it will be invisible because the light is deflected. So it's only what uh, goes through the, what the light can go through that you can see, but not what uh, is shielded somehow from the light. So it's, you're almost there. You're almost there. <laughs> we will have clocking devices anywhere. But that's a good idea. Well, there was a lot of study about the invisibility clock. And uh, in, the, in the past, it was just uh, theoretical. But now it's becoming uh, a material that people can use. Oh, yeah, they're already doing it, I think. <laughs> yeah, the new meta material for that one. That's a good idea. <laughs> Many people will be happy. So anyone else has to? Yes, Trevor? remind me what exactly the grey goo scenario is. Is that something? Yes. Oh, yes. Yeah. Well, hopefully not. <laughs> yeah, the grey goo. Um, the grey goo is um, um, a sort of scenario in nanotechnology where uh, you have something that works, as I said, but you don't under really understand how it works. So, Therefore, the, the thing, the material, can be good or bad. And uh, um, it's called gray because it's a sort of gray area. You don't really know if it is good or bad. 
and is this can be a good a sort of model thing that in which you can basically trap yourself um, somehow. Is that what you had in mind, uh, Trevor? It's a sort of apocalyptic scenario. Yeah. Where the thing may destroy us all. Yes, exactly. So we can basically get trapped in something that will harm us uh, quite a lot. And it's called grey goo for that reason, because we will get trapped in this uh, sort of apocalypse. But I don't think that it will happen if we understand what we are doing. It's probably going to happen if we keep doing things without really understanding. Then we will probably be in a grey goo sooner or later. But if we understand what we are doing, then we can probably a avoid to be basically trapped by a big blob of God knows what, which is the point of all that. <laughs> so as I said, nanotechnology is a wonderful thing, but we have to be careful. Because the problem is that the scale is so tiny and it can really enter anything and it can har harm us quite, quite a lot. That's why, for example, personally, um, personally I can't really use uh, um, something which has got nanoparticle inside. Even, even though I know they're safe, but still I have the sort of barrier, probably because I worked too much with nanoparticles, all the sunscreens, etc. They're good, but because I also work with L'Oreal once uh, um, in checking the nanoparticles, I sometimes prefer not to use just it. It's so successful, we could find the right size, but still. <laughs> so it's like, so th that's why we have to be careful, not just to use it, uh, just because someone is telling you, oh, use it, it's good. Well, I want to, personally, I want to know better. And I think that everybody should have this sort of attitude. Um, so that's why people should be made more aware of what nanotechnology is. Is there any other question? Sort of burning one? Yes. Can your students actually do any work with uh, nanotechnology? Uh, what, during their studies or generally? In the, in the laboratory, in your studies, yeah. Yes, they can. They can. Um, when you work with nanoparticles, there are procedures that need to be followed. So then we go into what is called uh, occupational health uh, or health in the workplace. So when they work, they have, for example, our year one students, they do an experiment with nanoparticles. They have to make gold nanoparticles, so different sizes. So in that case, we made the point that because they are making, literally making gold well, nanoparticles of different sizes, they have to be careful of, for example, wearing gloves. Because if, the nanopart if they can't control the size and uh, some liquid containing nanoparticles touches their skin, if they are small enough to enter the pores, that's not a very nice thing. And then, um, well, you can't really inhale them, but there are some processes where you, in particular for the top down, when you start either etching or you start literally pulverizing a material in order to get the nanoparticles, you can inhale it, so you have to wear masks. So that's the point we do with our students. So when they do the nanotechnology module with me, for example, I made the point, and then they have to do the experiment which with nanoparticles. I always made the point, you use them, but be aware that what you're using is something you can't see, but can harm you if you don't handle them properly. So there are sort of uh, um, safety uh, rules that need to be followed very strictly uh, in order to well, work safely. So it's possible, and we do, we do that, but be aware of that. Is there any other question you want to ask or curiosity? S sort of burning question you have? Yes, Ali. Uh, so you mentioned carbon nanotubes yep. as the uh, conductor of the future material in the future. How do you think the prospects are given that they're very hard to do that defects? The defects of in, in carbon nanotubes, yeah. so how to control them? Well, that is one of the, of the points. Is, Carbon nanotubes are a wonderful thing, but they are also quite dangerous. So in the past, for example, carbon nanotubes, um, and also now, well, you have to be careful when you made them. As, as Ali said, that you can have defects in the carbon nanotubes, or that means that if they're not made properly, 
rather than doing the job they are supposed to do, they do another one, which can be harmful. The other problem with carbon nanotubes is that um, they are sharp roads. Now, if you, you make them too sharp, like needles, literally needles, um, and you wear something which is made of carbon, carbon nanotubes, if it's not made perfectly well, um, some of the carbon nanotubes could potentially enter your body. So they have to be, therefore, well made, and also the material, well, the, like clothes or any, anything made with carbon nanotubes must be um, made at, at perfection in order to avoid the downside of basically being poisoned by carbon nanotubes just because you, are, you come into contact with them. And then, yes, also the defect. So when you manufacture them, then you have to be careful to how you do it. Because carbon nanotubes, they are made. I mean, they, they don't exist in nature, so human beings make, make, make them, and there are different methods you can use. Um, so the methodology is well controlled and well known, but still there are sort of gray areas uh, uh, in the manu manufacturing of carbon nanotubes that need to be explored a bit, a bit more. So yes, with carbon nanotubes, we need to be careful. There are a lot of things made of carbon nanotubes, even um, tennis rackets, for example, which, because they are light, a lot of bicycles, uh, mountain bikes, they are made of carbon nanotubes, but a lot of clothing also. So people need to be, to be aware of that, that there are carbon nanotubes inside, and to be careful to also to the manufacturer who is making it. So as, as you can see, there is always the downside. Is, is, nanotechnology is very useful, but you have to be aware of potential dangers of it, which are, I mean, we're not doing, going to die on nanotechnology, but, you know, hopefully not, at least. But being careful is a good thing, because it's helping us, after all. I mean, it's making our life quite easy. Any more curiosity? Yes, Peter. The government has a lot of effort into graphene. Yes. Taking into account all your concerns. Yes. Are those concerns being mitigated, if you like, with our rush into graphene? Well, graphene is, graphene is, a, is a great material. It's called the material of wonders because it just, well, one, um, just one layer of carbon atoms um, thick, so it's extremely thin, extremely flexible, and graphene has so far, uh, it seems that it's not harmful, it's not dangerous, which is the reason why it's uh, um, basically used so heavily. Because uh, graphite, from which graphene comes, uh, um, well, graphite is not really dangerous after all. I mean, graphite is, uh, you know, the pencil we use are, is graphite. So we can really have graphite uh, any, any time in our life, and we, we use it. But graphene is a material of wonders because it's not harmful. It doesn't really harm, after all. It's not toxic, or people didn't find any toxicity in graphene. That's why graphene is heavily used nowadays um, in, uh, well, in making, like, from microchips, and in fact, rather than the Silicon Valley, they want to call it the Graphene Valley, because silicon slowly, slowly is not used, um, well, slowly, slowly is going to be not used in making microchips or nanochips now, uh, because it will be made of graphene. Graphene has got uh, wonderful uh, um, mechanical and uh, chemical and uh, electrical and magnetic properties, and yes, it's not harmful to human beings, so, so that's why people use it quite safely. And it is a wonderful material, because it's got all the properties that the material should have in order to, again, make our gadgets, etc. So, yeah, there I don't have any concern. <laughs> I'm happy there with graphene. <laughs> any other question you want to ask? Or you're curious about? No? Well, in that case, so we can, you know, just try to wrap up this, this session. So thank you so much, really, for, for coming and for attending. <laughs> Hopefully you have enjoyed it. Um, as Claire was saying, this is the first one of a series. Uh, so the next one will be in January 2015. If I'm not mistaken, it will be 26th of January. 
and uh, it will be one of our colleagues from the National Physical Laboratory, which is our partner in the applied physics degree we have here. And he will be talking, if I'm not mistaken, about uh, very low temperatures. And uh, so there will be a uh, sort of uh, liquid nitrogen uh, type of event and you are more than welcome obviously to attend that one or the others the next the next one after the next one will be in april and it will be on bubbles again it will be our colleague from mpl and the last one will be ali which is sitting there wave come on <laughs> uh, another of our colleagues um, working with us on the on the degree another physicist and you will be talking about what ali Gravity. Gravity. He's a cosmologist, so I'm, I'm more the experimental side, he's more the theoretical side. <laughs> so, and he will be um, basically uh, concluding our first series of Physics Cafe talks. So I hope you, en you have enjoyed it, you have learned hopefully something. Uh, if you have any questions, more questions, you can just drop me an email anytime. But thank you so much for being with us this evening. Thank you. <laughs>